All right, let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for another great day. We thank you for another beautiful Sabbath day that you have given us, God. Another time to be able to come to your house and just sing praises to you. And Lord, I pray that even this day that we'll all come to a greater realization that you're all that we need. You're the one that we need and have that desire with inside of us, God. And we just thank you for your love. We thank you for your, even your patience with us, God, uh, in the world that we live in. And Father, I pray that today that you'll be in our midst, that your spirit will move in the hearts and lives of each and every person in this room, God, and even outside this room, Father, that, that we'll just come to a greater understanding of who you are and what you mean. And, Father, I pray that even this day again, God, that you just hide me behind that precious cross, that the words I speak are of you, Father, and only of you, and not of man, not at all, but only of you and your greatness and your love. And I just praise you and thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Book of Joshua. <clears throat> Book of Joshua. It's probably one of my favorite books, I guess you might say. It's... um. I like what it says. I like what has happened. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the the things about the book of Joshua, you know, Joshua was, was the one that uh, that's took up, I guess, after Moses. And uh, he took the people into the promised land and done a lot of battles. A lot of battles went on. They, uh, You know, the story about Jericho, and then they left there, and they, they conquered many kings. And even they went into the to the south of the region and they conquered that part and they went to the north of the region and they conquered that part and not only that but at the end they they took it and split it up into you know the tribes the 12 different tribes so a lot of things happen in the book of uh, in the book of Joshua but this is this is the last chapter of the book Joshua 24 this is the last chapter and Joshua is getting ready to pass away he's getting ready to die is what is happening. And in here, he's kind of giving the people, I guess, maybe the last command, I guess you might say, or the last instructions before he goes on to be with the Lord. And here, in this particular verse, and, and I love this, these two verses, and as I read them, I just, the Lord began to show me many things, and I want to share these things with you. Starting in verse 14 of the chapter 24 of Joshua. It says, Now, therefore, fear the Lord, Serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. He says, serve the Lord. And if it, seems, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as far as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And you, you, you see here what he's doing. He's, he's giving the people basically a choice. You know, who, who do you want? What, what do you want? Do you want to do what you've been doing? I mean, you stop and think about these people. They spent 400 years in bondage over in Egypt. They were slaves. So they, they were there for a long time. So you take all of these people, and what does it say? The Bible said it was 600,000 men. Men. That's not women and children. But I'm not going to get into all that. So if each one of them had a wife and a child, you're looking at, uh, what, a million, eight hundred thousand people. That's not counting animals or bigger families or anything. So if you had all these people and in, in slaves in, in Egypt, do you think all of them were serving God? No. I mean, probably some of them were you know, serving all these other gods. And that's the reason Joshua put this in here. Do you want to serve the ones that was on the other side of the river and in Egypt, or do you want to serve the Lord? Choose. You choose. Which one do you want? And that's what he was telling the people. That's what he was saying. And he even told them, he said, fear the Lord. And he was telling them, fear him. And that's as many times I said in the past few Sundays, you know, people in this world today, they, they're not scared of God. They're not. They're not scared of the Lord at all. They're, they're, I mean, look at them. Look at the world today. They're not scared. They're, the people do not fear God whatsoever. They don't know that God can do that and you're out. 
You know what I mean? He can. He has that power. He, he made you. He can take you out. He can do these things. And people, don't, people do not scare fear of him. They think, oh, I'm good. Everything is fine. And when in my last days, I hope that God sees me fit to bring me into his kingdom. That's not how it works. Not according to the Bible. That's not what, how, how it works. So people do not fear him. So Joshua was telling him, says, fear the Lord. And then he goes on and tells him to serve him. You know, who do you want to serve? The, the, the ones that your fathers did. Do you want to do what your ancestors did? Is that what you want to do? Do you want to live the way your, the, your parents and all did, serving other gods? Or, you don't, or do you want to serve the God that done all of these things to you and for you? Look at what he did. He parted a sea. A big, massive sea. And what does the Bible say? It says that they walked on dry land. That's what the Bible says. In all of these movies and pictures and stuff, I seen one of week, about a week or so ago. They were, they were on the banks of the, of the Red Sea, and all of a sudden this great wind came. And what did they do? They went wading out into the water. And I said, no, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that they walked on dry land. You know, is that not the power of God? And not only that, it says that whenever... They got across, and the Egyptians came along. What did he do? Moses let his arms down, and it says the walls of water destroyed the entire army of the Egyptians, and they washed up on the sea. They seen these things, manna from heaven. They seen quails falling from the sky. They seen Jericho. They walked around it seven times, and they tooted their little horns, and all of a sudden the walls come down. And God did these things. And all of these things, and he says, don't you fear him. Don't you want to serve him? And even all the way in the beginning of Joshua, Joshua 1, in verse 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it on day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then, and this is what he said, he says, For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success when you do the things that I tell you to do. And this is what Joshua was telling the people. And this is what I'm getting at. Do you know in these, in these two verses that I just read, Joshua 24, 14, and 15, the word serve is in those two verses seven times. Seven times. The number seven means complete. Complete. So if we serve him the way that God wants us to serve him, Will we not be complete? Will we not be complete? So Joshua is telling them, serve. All of these different ones, it says serve him in sincerity. And he goes on, says, away from the gods of the fathers, served on the other side of the river. And then he says plainly, serve the Lord. Then he goes on, he says, and if it seems, seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of the fathers serve that we're on the other side of the river, and it goes down and says, but for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Service. You ever wonder what serve means? What is serve? That verse says, now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth. This word serve means to labor, is what it means. It means to labor, it means to work. It also means to till. And I thought that was real sharp whenever we was, in Sunday school this morning, we was talking about the land and different things, and, and Bo had mentioned something about plowing, and I thought about this word, tilling the ground. You ever thought about tilling the ground for God? You ever thought about breaking up some ground for God? That's going out and sharing, planting a seed, doing things, doing what needs to be done, serving Him, working. And it's not necessarily talking about physical labor. It's not necessarily talking about that. It also means to cause to labor. You ever thought about if you brought someone to the Lord or brought someone to church, you are bringing, you are causing them to do something. You actually are. You cause that person to do something. And that thing that they're doing is thinking. They're working. They're working this up here. They're beginning to think. And not only that, whenever God begins to move in them, what happens? This in here begins to go to work. Not your conscience, but the Spirit of God. It begins to go to work inside of you, so it is causing you to labor, to give birth to something. You ever thought about that? To give birth to something. What happens when a woman is in labor? They're having great pains, and what happens when they give birth? There's a child. Something new is being born. 
you ever thought about your labor in Christ? You're giving birth to something. You're helping birth maybe a new Christian. You're helping maybe birth a new thought, an idea, maybe a spiritual revelation, something bringing open inside of the spirit world that people need to see on the other side, knowing that it's real. You're laboring for God. That is service, people. That is serving God. That is taking it to another level. Even in Mark 10 and 45, it says, Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus himself. It says he didn't even come to be served. He come to serve. He come to serve his God and do what, was, do what his father told him to do. And how many people may say, well, how can I serve God? I go to church. Okay. So? So does half the world. And a lot of them ain't even Christians. So going, going to church is a good thing. It is a good thing, but don't you ever think about doing other things to serve him? I just mentioned labor, doing things. That means you physically have to do something. You physically have to make a move. You ever thought about studying your Bible? You can get labor intense studying the Bible. You can spend hours, even days on end, looking at one topic. One topic in the Bible because it's endless. It can just keep going and going. Even 2 Timothy 2 and 15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. You don't say man. Unto God. You're serving God when you're studying and you're looking and you're digging and you're doing research and finding all different things that maybe you never even dreamed of. And then not only that, but whenever, you, whenever you're doing these things and you're serving God and he's showing, you're proving yourself to him, Friends, let me tell you something. He will open up the spirit world with inside of your mind to show you things that you have never seen. The Bible says that. The Bible says he can do it. This is serving him. This is doing. And three things. You all have heard this. There's, there's what I call the three T's of serving God. And this is, this is some ways, and I'm not going to dwell on this a long time. One is tithe, and I'm not preaching on tithe. I don't preach on money. I've told you before, I don't want your money. I've got money. I don't need yours. I'm, I don't preach on money. You don't, you've never heard me preach on it. But tithing is one thing, and I do believe in it. In Malachi 3 and 10, it says this, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that they may be food in my house. And this is what I love, and I believe this with all my heart because the Scripture says it, and it says, and try me. Try me now on this. See if I won't do what I tell you I'll do. Test me. Give me a, give me a, give, give me a chance. And I love this. It says, try me now on this, says the Lord of hosts. Says the Lord of hosts. God said it. He said, try me. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that there will not be room enough to receive it. It's a promise. My friends, it's a promise that God has to keep. And that's the reason he says, try me. And one great thing in verse 11, it says that I will rebuke the devourer, the ones who try to steal your funds and steal your money. If you give me what I'm supposed to have, give me all that I want, all that I ask for, I will destroy the ones who try to take it from you. That's a promise. That's a promise. It, it's, it's God's promise. But you remember, people don't fear God. People ain't scared of him. I run my money. I take care of my funds. I don't have to worry about this. People ain't scared of him. But he said, even try me. Try me. Just try me. See if I won't do this. And that's one of the things that we can do. And it says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. For your sake. And it goes on, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. The fruit of your ground nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts, and all the nations will call you blessed. Can you imagine? It says, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. And that's the end of that. Tithing, that's one way of serving God. Another thing is talent. Do you know everybody in the, on this planet has a talent of something, some sort of some way? Everybody has some form of a talent. It don't matter what it is or anything. I, I, I know 
I know I don't know this person personally, and I know y'all have probably seen him on TV. He has no arms or no legs, but he's one of the powerfulest speakers you've ever seen of God. He has no arms or no legs, but he is one of the most powerful preachers you ever heard in your life. Everybody has a talent. Everybody has it. Even the Bible says in 1 Peter 4 and 10, as each one has received a gift. That's Bible. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. As good stewards and the manifold grace of God. Everybody has a gift. Everybody has a talent. Everybody has a gift. Everybody can serve God. In 1 Corinthians 3 and 4, and if this is the ESV, it says now there are varieties of gifts. So they're all different. Nobody's the same. Everybody's made different. If there's a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. And there's a variety of service, but the same Lord. And there's a variety of activities. But it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. He said, serve God. Who will you serve? Do what God says. All of these, many of these things come from the Old Testament. Tithing began in the Old Testament. Even, even, can you imagine whenever Joshua was meeting all of these people, all the different talents that they had? Could you imagine whenever they went up to the walls of Jericho, they was, some of them were toting horns, some of them was to toting the Ark of the Covenant, some of them was toting swords, some of them were just being quiet. Everybody was different. But yet they were serving. They were doing what they were supposed to be doing. All of these different things. And one more was time. Do you give your time to God? Do you serve God with your time? Or do we waste our time? Needlessly, just uselessly. In Ephesians 5 and 15, and I, and I like this. I mean, if you want a word, you can just look in the Bible and you can find a word to go with it. It says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise men, making the best use of the time. Making the best use of the time. It says, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of God, will of the Lord is. Your time. You ever, and, I, and I wrote this down. You know, there's 168 hours in a week. Seven days, 24 hours a day, do the math, 168 hours in a week. So if you took eight hours of that of each day and you slept, that's 56 hours, okay? So that leaves you 112 hours awakening time, okay? If you're awake, 112 hours. And most people spend about an hour and a half in church. Some people... Read a chapter a day. Well, how long does it take? Maybe 10 minutes at the most to read a chapter in the Bible. That's probably the longest chapter. So that equals up to an hour and 10 minutes. And then maybe a person may pray, pray for about five minutes in a prayer. And that equals 35 minutes in a day. And the total time that a person has given to God is two and a half hours a week. 10% of 160 is 16.8 hours a week. If you gave God 10% of your talent, 10% of your time, and 10% of your money, if that's what God requires, how much time do we spend with the Lord? How much time do we truly spend with the Lord? Do we give him the time that we're supposed to have? Joshua told these people, choose this day who you will serve. Whether Joshua talked about this, I don't know. You know, he, he may not have. He might have went a whole totally different route. But I, when I, as I was reading this, how do we serve God? Do we truly serve God the way we're supposed to serve him? Do we spend our time wisely with him? When we pray, do we just pray some little prayers? Or, or do we truly do some heartfelt stuff. Really get sincere with him and tell him, talk to him. Maybe even ask him to show me something. Show me something new. Show me something vibrant. Do you seek what he has to offer? Do you know that there's more to God? And y'all heard me say this than just coming in here sitting to me and listening to me flap my gums. There's more to him. Me and two gentlemen were talking this morning in Sunday school. 
and we were talking about some great massive things and we began to talk and I showed them something. Friend, God is real. So is Satan. Satan has in his little demons work in such ways that you don't even know. You don't even imagine. You know, we don't see things like we should see. And, it's by, and the verse even went on. It said, serve him in sincerity and truth. In 1 Thessalonians, I'm just going to go somewhere, and some of you may not like it, and that is okay. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 16, it says, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. and everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And this is the verse you hear all the time. Do not quench the spirit, and that's when most people stop. The next verse says, do not dis despise prophecies. It says, don't despise prophecies. And it even goes on, it says, test all things. Do you test them? Do you check out things that come along in your life and see whether it's of God or whether it's of devil, the devil? Do you see where it comes from? Do you notice where it comes from? It says, hold fast to what is good. And then some people even skip this verse. It says abstain from every form of evil. Every form of evil. These people that Joshua was talking to, Joshua was about to die. <clears throat> he didn't, you know, I mean, granted, he didn't know the future. But, you know, praise God that we got the book. We know what happened to them. You know what happened to them? They went to serve in other gods. The Bible tells us in the New Testament times in which we live in, it says abstain from every form of evil. God told those people, he said, you stay away from any of these other gods and you serve me and I will take care of you, I will bless you, and I will do all of these things. What happened? They went over into the new land of Canaan with full of milk and honey and what happened? They got over in there and they got to dealing with other people that did not know God and got to hanging around with them. And what did I tell you last week? If you play with a snake sooner or later, he's going to bite you. And that's what happened. They got to messing with them. They got to marrying them just like they said don't do. They got to worshiping these Asher poles. They got to worshiping Baal and all of these other things. And what happened? God left them. He said, when you decide to come back to me, then I will help you. Otherwise, just like in the New Testament times, it says, I will turn you over to a reputate mind. In other words, it's saying if that's the way you want to live and that's the way you want to think and that's who you want to serve, then have at it. And that's what God is telling the people. But Joshua is saying today, choose who you're going to serve. Choose who you're going to serve. Who are you going to serve? And even, even these things, I want to mention of just a few things of how we can understand the sincerity and the truth of God's word. That the world today does not even look at it. You know the little phrase, oh, it's okay? Everybody, everybody knows that phrase, right? Bob your little heads up and down. Everybody knows it. I'm just going to show you something. It says in sincerity and truth. And this is where so many people, they will not dabble on it. They won't touch it. They'll leave it alone because they're scared. They will hurt people's feelings. Friends, if your feelings are hurt, then you may need to go and do some of that intense praying that I'm talking about. You may need to go and do some of that studying that I was mentioning and see what the Word of God says and see what the world is trying to show you and the way the world is trying to take you. Just like I said last week, friends, there's things that are under your nose that you don't even know that belongs to Satan even under your nose, even in your homes, even in the things that we watch, Satan does everything he can to get in. And that's what happened to the children of Israel. That's what happened. They got over there. They was not serving God. They was not doing things. Just like this one little phrase in this verse I just read it that says, do not despise prophecies. You ever had anybody prophesy over you? Have you? You ever had anybody come up and just prophesy over you? Say, God said this. I'm, I'm supposed to share this with you. And the world says, no, they don't do that anymore. Really? Come on. The Bible talks about it. 
In Romans 12, it talks about it. In 1 Corinthians 12 and 4 through 11, it talks about it. In 1 Corinthians 12 and 28, it talks about it. It talks about these things, the gift of wisdom, the gift of knowledge, the gift of faith, the gift of healing. Have you ever had anybody come up to you and lay hands on you and heal you? It still happens today, but people don't believe it, and that's the reason it don't work. People don't have the faith that they're supposed to have, just what I just mentioned. It even says the gift of miracles. Everybody says, oh, we see miracles all the time. People go in the hospital and they come out well. Yes, they, ha yes, they do. But you ever, see, you ever seen one that you could not explain? A miracle of God that you could not explain. That the only way that it could happen was him. These things. These things. And not only that, it talks about the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy. The gift of discerning spirits. You ever walked into a place, maybe a room, maybe on a piece of ground, maybe into a church, and walked in and you felt something so doggone heavy that you knew something wasn't right? Or maybe you walked in there and there was just such a vibrant, full, flowing, just like milk and honey, and just, I mean, just so thick, but you could feel the blanket of God moving inside of you discerning spirits it's a spirit it's not a coincidence coincidence people does not exist only in the dictionary there's no such thing people as coincidence it does not work it it it, it, it don't even jive it, it cannot even it's like water and oil it just don't work it, it just it don't mix the only two things in this world are good and evil. And Joshua told the people that day, choose you this day who you will serve. So have you ever walked into a place or even on a piece of land or into someone's home and you knew something just wasn't there? That's discerning the spirits. That's understanding that there's something there. That don't belong. It don't belong. It's, it don't, it's not there. And it goes on. It says the gift of tongues. And even the gift of interpreting tongues. It's real. It's real. So don't tell me that you cannot believe in these things, but yet you can believe the entire Bible. Choose. Do you believe it or not? It's real. The Bible speaks of it. The Bible even speaks of predestination. So don't tell me you, you believe in the entire Bible and you don't believe everything in it. These things happen. These things are real. These things are, uh, exist. And it even says the gift of an administration and the gift of helps. All of these things. So don't despise prophecies. Even this one little bitty particular verse, it can go just so many different directions. So maybe even Joshua was telling the people, said, look, don't, don't, don't put out anything that God can do. God can do these things. God can show you these things. God can teach you these things. So this is who you need to serve. But even, even that other little verse, it says, abstain from every form of evil. Every form of evil. It don't say abstain from evil. It says every form of evil. F-O-R-M, form of evil. So that means there's a shape. Some form of a shape or something. Something, something has to be there that you can visibly see it. It can be a form of evil. And it can be. One of the greatest things that are in this world today, one of the greatest things that are in this world today is witchcraft. People don't, people pretend it don't exist, but it does. It, it happens, and it works. It does. They, they work from Satan just like we work from God. God has more power. We're on the winning team. They're on the losing team. But they can make things happen. They can. It, it can happen. Satan has some powers to do things. God has more power. But yet, we don't fear God, remember? We don't serve God. These people decided not to. 
So we wonder why Satan gets so much control is because we don't take authority over him. You ever thought about it? We don't take authority over it. Do you know that your God, the God that we serve, can destroy Satan just like that? If I can snap my fingers. Can just like that. I mean, you've done read the last chapter. You know what's going to happen to him. So why not take authority over him now? So why not do these things? Witchcraft and all of these things. Sorcerers and all these things. They exist. They're in the world. And it says abstain from every form of evil. In Deuteronomy 18 and 10 it says this. There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or daughters pass through the fire. Or that use divination or an observer of times. That's horoscope. That's what that means. I'm sorry, people, but that's what it means. If you're reading your horoscope, then you're doing what the Bible says don't do. I'm sorry, I'm just a messenger. Or any observer of times or enchanter or a witch. That's what it says in Deuteronomy. And this little, let me just throw this in there. It says, therefore not be found among you anyone that makes his son or daughters pass through the fire, which that means what they were doing were doing human sacrifices. That's what it means. They were actually taking their children and burning them. That's what that means. It says stay away from any form of evil. So that means witches, observer of times, which is someone that can try to tell you your future, which today is your horoscope. Divination means sorcerers, soothsayers. Witches, witchcraft, all of those things, that's what it means. And Deuteronomy 12 and 31 says this, you shall, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. You, you can't worship God and, and, and do these things in the same. You can't. It, it just don't work. It don't mix. It says you not, shall not worship the Lord your God in that way for any abomination to the Lord which he hates they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. People of this day and time, in this day and time that I'm talking about, if you go and you do some research, even over in the book of Corinthians, if you really do some historical research on what they were doing, what Paul was trying to tell those people in those churches, the people in, in the Corinth area, we're trying to bring in to the church these forms of religion, trying to mix it. Where they were trying to bring witchcraft in, they were trying to bring sorcery, they were trying to bring the Greek gods into the church, trying to mix this stuff in. And that's what Paul was telling them time and time again to stop doing this. And even God told them way back, way back there to leave this mess alone, stay away from it. Who are you going to serve? Just, you know, Joshua was asking him, who are you going to serve? Who are you going to serve? Are you going to do it in truth? Are you going to do it in sincerity? And two more verses on this. In Leviticus 19 and 31, it says, Give no regard to mediums. What's that lady's name on TV? The little Manhattan medium? What does it say? Give no regard to mediums. So if you watch that show, friend, and I'm going to say it, if you watch that TV show, you're bringing it into your home. You're bringing it into here. You're bringing it into here because you're sitting there approving of what she says because you're watching it. That's what that means. That's exactly what that means. It says, what did I just say? You give no regard to mediums and even familiar spirit. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. Just by watching them, you can be defiled. Just by watching them in our day and time. It says, I am the Lord your God. Even in Leviticus 20 and 6, it says this. The person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits, listen, to prostitute himself with them. So in other words, you're giving yourself over to them. That's, that's what it means. I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. 
And don't give me this thing about that's Old Testament. My friends, you cannot have the New Testament without the Old. So anything that you sit and watch on TV that does not pertain to the will of God, then you're bringing it into your house. That's what it means. So Joshua might have been telling these people, say, look, you're fixing to go into a land. You're fixing to go into a land that worships Baal. They have witchcraft. They have spirits. They have soothsayers. They have all of these different things. Stay away from them. What was, that, what was that verse I read right over here? It said, uh, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. The very first thing Joshua told them, remember these things that you've got, these books. When you go into this land, stay away from it. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve the God that you know, or are you going to serve these other things? You're about to go up against these things. You're about to see all of these things that are happening. So stay away from them. Who are you going to serve? And do it in truth. And another thing, it says test all things. You ever thought about testing a spirit? Have you ever tested one? In John, 1 John 4 and 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit, whether they are God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. If you'll notice at the very end of that verse, it says, Because... Many false prophets have gone out into the world. That's where that little phrase that you hear so many times, and even myself have shared things with people, and you hear that little phrase, oh, it's okay. That's a lie. That is a lie. It's not okay. The Bible says that we're not supposed to do these things. When you hear somebody tells you, oh, it's okay, or it's not going to hurt, or it's not real, or it, you know, I, I, I did it when I was a kid, it's wrong, it's a lie, that is a false prophet. That's what that means. Anything that is said that is not biblical, that is not pertain to the verses of God, that God tells us the things that we're not supposed to do, it is coming from a false prophet. It does not have to be some big, great, big old preacher standing on up in front of a TV with 10 or 15, 30,000 people in congregation telling you to smile and be happy. It don't have to come from them. It can come from someone on the street. And Satan can work through them just as much as he can through a person standing behind a wooden podium. That's still a false prophet. It's still a false prophet if they tell you, oh, it's okay. That's wrong. But the verse says, it says, choose for yourself this day who you will serve. I've told you this time and time again. Every person, man, woman, and child that walks out this door today, even myself, when you walk out this door, you will make a decision one way or the other. It may not be your final decision, but you will make a decision on which direction your path that you are going to walk. You will. Uh, that's just the way it works. You know, when God shares something with you or shares the truth of something with you, you make a decision of whether or not you want to keep it or not. The word choose means to decide. That's what it means. It means to decide. It also means to elect. It also means to select. So you're going to kind of select which direction you want to go. It also means to a point. It also means desire. What is your choice? Do you choose to desire God? We just sang a song about him. You were my desire, and everybody was sitting here singing and all that type of stuff. Did you mean it, or was you just singing? What is your desire? Just like these people, just like the people Joshua was talking to, what is your desire? In Matthew 4 and 19, it says this, then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. This is New Testament. This is Jesus. Jesus told the people this. He gave them a choice. But you know, there's one thing, and the reason I'm sharing all these different things with you, I know this is a variety of stuff, a lot to take in. But you know, <clears throat> and I've said this before, people don't, many, a lot of people of this world don't want to know more about God. They don't. A lot of people of this world don't even want to even understand some of the things, even the, some of the things that I share with you. 
especially like when it comes to talking about land. You know, I was talking about that. Have you ever prayed over your land? You know, have you ever done that? Have you ever prayed over the land around your home that God would bless it? Have you ever went through your home and found things that were not godly and done away with them? These things exist. Many people don't want to understand that. Jesus said, follow me. You know, so if we're following Jesus the way that we're supposed to be doing, the way that the biblical way that it says to do, do you know that the, that the spirit realm, the spiritual side of God will begin to open up and show you things? That your eyes can be opened to see things that you've never seen before. That whenever you go down the street and you all of a sudden you see something on a sign, you say, man, I remember seeing something about that being satanic or a symbol or, or something like that. Your eyes, your spiritual eyes begin to open. You begin to see things, but many people don't want to see this. They don't want to understand. They want their life to be simple. They want to be able to just come into a church, sit, listen, go home, and do their thing. But Joshua said, choose this day who you will serve. So serving God goes beyond just doing these little trivial little things that we do each and every day. Because the Bible even plainly says in Ephesians 6 and 12, it says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but the princip against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age. So it goes beyond those things. It goes beyond. So can you imagine whenever Joshua was trying to explain these things, maybe that God had already showed Joshua something else. And he was trying to tell them people, look, if you'll just serve God, serve him so that your eyes will be opened, your hearts will be opened, your minds will be opened. You'll begin to see these things because you're about to go into a land where there's witchcraft, where there's sorcery, where there's divination where they're serving other gods and you, and you won't even see it because they'll come in and they'll convince you that it's okay and next thing you know you're doing something that's totally wrong but yet in your mind you think you're so right all of these things all of these things so we're not just dealing with flesh and blood and this is a couple of more even, even Jesus told him in Luke 10 and 19, he says, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. Friends, these are not the little animals that you think of. They're not the little animals that you think of. I'm not talking about walking around stomping on snakes and little bugs and stuff like that. The scorpion represents Satan and his demons. And God has given us that authority to do those things. He has, people. He has given us that authority and we don't use it. People don't use it. Knowing that they can stand up and defeat Satan. Is not your God stronger than him? Is not the God that we serve stronger than Satan? God made him. God made him. Even in the last chapter it says he's going to be locked up. He's already defeated. So if he's already defeated and Jesus came and gave us that authority, then why don't we use it? Choose this day who you will serve. So that we can have these things. So that we can see these things and come to an understanding. It says scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. You have the authority to go over all the power of Satan. All of it. Every bit of it. Have you ever went before God on your knees? Just like the prayer. Have you ever went before God on your knees and said, God, you said I can do it. Do it through me. You said I can do it. So then prove yourself. He tells us to do this. Didn't he just say, test me with your money? What about testing him with the authority that we say that he, he says that we can have? Why not do those things? Why not do those things? He said we can do it. And even Joshua was telling the people, choose. And the sad part of it is in the world today, people don't choose the God. They choose religion. It's sad. They choose religion. They just want to do their own little thing. And the last couple of things, real quick. In 1 John 4 and 4, it says, you are, you are of God. Little children, you have overcome them. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We, 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 we speak these things, we say these verses and all that, and we don't no more believe them than we can throw it. People say all these things, and it's sad, and they don't believe it. 
If you believe the Bible, then believe it. Believe what God's word says. Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. And this is the last one. Some people in this world don't choose. Some people in this world don't choose to serve God. They don't. And you say, oh, I know there's lost people all over the world. And yeah, that's true. But did you know that there's people sitting in churches today, they still don't choose to serve God. It's true. They don't. They don't choose it whatsoever. And this is, I, I love this right here, Luke 9, 57. It says, now it happened as they journeyed. Now, and I like it when it starts like that. Now it happened. Okay, here it goes. As they journeyed on the road, that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he turned around and told him and said, Then he said to another, Follow me. But the, this guy said, Lord, let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said, Let the dead bury the dead, and you go preach the kingdom of God. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that mess. What he was trying to tell this man is don't worry about the things of the world. You do what I can tell you to do. You do what I tell you to do, and you do what my word says. Do what he says. Follow him. Choose. This guy chose to do something else. He said, let the dead bury the dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And then the next one said, another one said, Lord, I will follow you, but let first let me go and bid them farewell who are in my house. So see, this guy wanted to go tell somebody bye. But what he was telling the people, don't let the world consume you. You do what I say. You do what I show you. Come to me. Choose you this day who you will serve. And then it goes on, and I, and I love this verse. This is one verse that just scares me to death in the Bible. But Jesus said to him, no one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Think on that one. Chew on it a while. How many people do you know have jumped out there and went to serving God, and all of a sudden now they're back to doing what they used to do? No man who has put his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. I didn't. I did not say that. That's what Jesus said. It says, serve him in sincerity and truth. Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. And Jeremiah 3.3.3, 3, 3, 3, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. See, all the things I just mentioned is true according to that. God can show us things that we don't even know. He can. But we've got to choose who we're going to serve. Choose you this day who you serve. And I can say this with sincerity of heart. As far as me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Till my last breath. I will. I can't look back. I can't gamble like that. I cannot look back. Because he said if any man looks back, he's not fit. So maybe sometimes we do need to stop and choose who we want to serve. Just like I said, and I'm going to end with this, every person that walks out of this room today, you will choose. You're going to choose. You may have already made up your mind. I don't know. Only God knows. 